Bless the whole day's program, Lord. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so today we are celebrating Reach the World Media Ministry. That's the theme that the GC has chosen for this Sabbath. Okay, so let us all sing few hymns, praise his holy name. Okay, to begin with our song service this morning, let's sing hymn number 240. Hymn number 240, Fairest Lord Jesus. This hymn expounds on the theme of the beauty of Christ and the creation in an overflowing exp expression of praise. Similar to King David's statement which said, One thing have I asked of the Lord that I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord. Psalm chapter 24 verse 4. Let's sing 240, Fairest Lord Jesus. unto Jesus. Psalm chapter 55 verse 22 says, cast your burden on the Lord and he will sustain you. He will never allow the righteous to be moved. 
cast the whole of your care, all your anxieties, all your worries, all your concerns once and for all on him. For he cares for you affectionately and cares about you watchfully. Let's sing, cast your burdens unto Jesus. chapter 6 verse 8 through 11 says that that he died he died to sin once for all but the life he lives he lives to God in the same way count yourselves dead to sin but alive to God in Christ let's sing hymn number 251 he lives
our next song, let's sing this chorus, I will serve thee. Serving allows us to experience God's presence in new ways. Encouragement and healing go hand in hand. When we encourage others in Christ's name, it does something to us. As we encourage others, they find healing and we are encouraged. It's the reason so many people that go on mission trips say they came home feeling like they got more than they gave. Let's sing this chorus, I will serve thee. Good morning and a happy Sabbath to all of you. Hope you had a wonderful week. Uh, in the Bible, the psalmist says, I was glad when they told me, let us go into the house of the Lord. God has been merciful unto us throughout the last week and he has brought us to his temple to worship him in spirit and in truth. We are not here because of ourselves. We are called by God because of his mercy and grace. He has called us to worship him on this Sabbath morning. I'm so happy to see all of you here for this Sabbath school program. I want to extend a warm welcome to all of you on behalf of the Sabbath school department and the church for our opening song. Let us sing the hymn, Hark the Voice of Jesus Calling. Hymn number...
Hymn number 359, let's all rise. loving and living Father which art in heaven. Thank you Lord for this beautiful Sabbath morning that you have given to each one of us. That we may come to your sanctuary to seek your face, to lift up our voices and sing praises unto you for you alone Lord is worthy of glory, honor and praise. There is none like thee in this world Lord. We thank you and we adore you and praise you from the bottom of our hearts. For you have been faithful unto us. You have been merciful unto us. We thank you, Lord, for the many privileges, many blessings that you have given to us throughout the past week. You've been with us. You've provided for our needs. You've taken care of all our wants. Lord, as we have gathered here this morning to worship you, we pray, Father, that you would accept this worship. That you would pour out your spirit upon each one of us. That we may fill the emptiness that is in our hearts. That we may be happy. That we can say that we have heard the voice of Jesus this morning. Thank you for all those who have come here to worship thee. Thank you for those who are watching online and thank you for those who are on their way to the church. We pray, Father, that you would bless this day. We pray for those who are 
presenting the programs. May your spirit lead them. Thank you once again, Lord, for this privilege. We pray that you would forgive our sins and shortcomings, that we may be holy and righteous. For all these mercies, we ask in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Good morning, church. And very happy Sabbath. Today's mission report is coming from... Uh, the title of the mission report is Song in My Heart. It's a story about Gabriela, a young girl who was very passionate about her singing. She has got a good voice. She was blessed with the talent. So as she grew up in a small town, her mother taught her how important to keep the Sabbath day holy. So as she grew up, she knew about Jesus and she was very glad to sing uh, for Jesus. As she grew up, uh, she was in the college when she started in her musical group and she was thinking that she will be gladly thinking, she was thought that she will be a star in future in her career and become famous in her college and in upcoming in this world. Gabriella song with several music groups. Gabriella enjoyed going to parties and she was spending her money on buying her luxurious items. But Gabriella was really was not happy. She was like missing something in her heart. Uh, she was uh, happy, she earned much to spend her money, but still then there's something missing in her heart. And one day she attended Seventh-day Adventist Church. As she is a Christian, on the Saturday she attended the Sabbath. So she heard a music in the church and she was very glad. When she heard the music, she was, her heart was filled with uh, like pleasant and peace it was. And she was thinking that also she was glad to attend the church again and again. And as the days passed by, the COVID-19 has started and the pandemic has started. But in her heart, uh, she was feeling that she wants to be a famous star singing, not for Jesus, just outside. She wanted to make money. But still then, the, when the pandemic has started, she, she was becoming very close. She started attending the church because she has no other opportunity to go and explore her outside in parties and all. But she has the only thing she can do in the YouTube. She was able to sing for Jesus and she sang and she was close with the church pastor's friend. And every week she'll be attending her Sabbath school uh, and she was very glad. And again, she accepted Jesus when, uh, before she astray the, her parts from Jesus. And again, she took baptism and she rededicated her heart to Jesus through baptism. Through her influence, uh, her four of her friends got baptized in the church during the pandemic. And she gave a special uh, message to the youngsters here. Gabriella has a special message for young people. Do not waste your talent in the worldly pleasures. Just whatever the talent is given to you, it's given by Jesus. So uh, utilize it for Jesus and sing his glory and always be glorified his name, always glorify his name. So her Sabbath school offering will be going to La Paz uh, in, in her hometown, that is Bolivia, uh, in her hometown, and uh, these offerings will be used to open a new church in, uh, in her hometown. So please kindly give your offering generously, Sabbath school offering, so that we can help uh, Gabriela to open her new church there. Thank you so much.
Good morning. Have a very happy Sabbath. Today, the World Church Calendar suggests the theme, Reach the World Media Ministries. So, we have requested the Media Ministries to take uh, the Sabbath school today. We have a short uh, there's not much information about Adventist media ministry, but we run a lot of things on media. So we don't have a specific web page or a message which has come from General Conference. But just to uh, share some of the thoughts and some of the things that we do as an Adventist church is what I thought we need to share today. Sharing, um, sharing Christ and it's a message center of hope, wholeness through technology and media. So that's what media ministry is all about. Can somebody open Matthew 28, 19 to 20? And please read it for me. Matthew 28, 19 and 20. Can someone read Matthew 28, 19 to 20, please? Okay, let me do that. Yeah, please go ahead, Uncle. All right, so even unto the end of the world, a message has to go. Right, so go therefore, teach all nations. We read the whole thing. And we said unto the ends of, end of the world. Where is the world? Where is the world today? We have about 7 billion people in the world. And at least 2.5 billion, 2.5 billion are on social media. So... That makes it very critical. Study shows that an average person spends two hours a day on social media. So what is so what is media? Media is basically different forms of communication. So it's basically a way of reaching a large number of people. So it can be through newspapers, magazines, televisions, films, videos, books, radios, radio, musical recordings, etc. So any form of media is usually very neutral and it can be good or bad. So one of the things that we do as part of Adventure Club, the Builder class has something called as Media Critic Award because we want to start early to show what is good media and what is bad media. So for two weeks, they're supposed to write everything they're doing, you know, whether they're spending time on TV or the phone or reading something, they're supposed to record so that they know what is right or wrong from a tender age because media, just like any technology, can be a boon or a bane, right? So today's society, children and adults, just about everyone is bombarded by media messages and it's very hard to avoid not being impacted by it. And that's why it's important that we really understand how we control what is good for us and how what is helpful. So now let's look at the helpful part. The Adventist Church has a long history of uh, media-based communication. And this started with the Millerite moment in 1840s. We have heavily used print media. At that time, that was the technology. Over years, we changed. As technology advanced, our media ministry had to evolve. I think it's one of the... Um, most innovative place in church because we have to keep up with the trends of the industry. As Adventists, we want to find friends to, uh, and help them understand the Bible and share the hope of Jesus. So the communication department of the Adventist church provides multiple tools and uh, for our church members to share. It is through phone apps, websites, social media channels, video programming, gaming, you even have uh, puzzles, like the primary class has jigsaw puzzles where you 
have a message after that. So there's so many ways. We also have news reporting, press releases, and that's how we try to reach our audience outside and both inside and outside the church. But ultimately the goal of our media ministry should be clearly to effectively share the love of Jesus to others and invite people to come into our church. Some of the examples that the Adventist Church uses today for media ministry is Voice of Prophecy. I think uh, many of us grew up with Voice of Prophecy, which is a very dedicated department. There's to write letters and so many people got to know about um, Jesus through Voice of Prophecy. And then you had Adventist World Radio. We had radio programs running. But right now, we have more. Uh, you know, we have Hope Channel, 3ABN, our local Christian channels where Adventists go and preach. We started off with magazines like Review and Herald, Adventist Review, Signs of the Time. And then we have so many glow tracks. Even now, right here within our church, we can, which we can use to go and reach people. One of the things... Um, which can be a cause of concern now is the changing laws within our um, country. So media is one way that we can reach without really being face-to-face -face communication with people and show them a way to invite them to church. Can somebody read Revelation 14.6? This is to understand why media ministry and why the Seventh-day Adventist Church has accepted this challenge. That's Revelation 14, 6. Exactly. So the three angels message says that the good news has to go to every nation, tribe, language and people. How do we do that? I think media really gives us this advantage because here success is meeting people where they are. So let's see some of the advantages of media ministry. We have challenges, some of the advantages are when we live stream what's happening in our church, it's one of the most powerful digital media uh, ministry, I should say, because we are able to extend the reach of our ministry beyond the walls of our church. If you look at the weekly attendance, let's look at our church now. We don't have our whole church here. Our membership is quite much more than what we see right now in the pews. But here we understand that we have, in reality, just a fraction of our congregation in church. I'm not talking about the membership. But our congregation can just, just be anyone. We just have a fraction of our congregation here. But when we are able to record these messages, upload them on YouTube or, you know, be able to live stream somewhere, there may be many, many people who are not sitting here today who are able to listen to these messages. So Adventist Archives has a page which where we have our messages on YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. Everywhere we, we have reached and you just have to click on the links when we go to Adventist Media Ministry. There are so many links which take us to the archives about the history of our church, the sermons, everything on these media, on these platforms. So by doing this, we are actually offering the message to shut-ins, traveling members, church shoppers and others who don't have a guaranteed seat in the church for multiple personal or any reasons that they have. But we are, glo we are, global, uh, we are creating a platform globally accessible and which is a great connection point to the church. If people are no longer attending church or you know, they're reticent to attending public meetings, are scared to open their front door to a friendly knock, the media offers an avenue to allow a Christian viewpoint into their homes. So this is the emphasis of how much we can do as part of communications and media ministry. One of the tools that the world uses today is networking, right? I remember uh, when I was very small, I was not even a teenager, I think I was 9, 10 years old, and my dad 
preached a sermon and he did some calculation and said this is the world's population today. This is the number of Adventists today. If every Adventist brings one friend to church once uh, and regularly and gives them Bible study once for one person a year and that person comes in and does it for another person so exponentially we grow and it would have taken just 13 years for the whole world to get the message that God has for them. If every Adventist church, I think that was sometime in the um, 90s that I heard them saying this 30 years ago. And today we still struggle with all the media that we have because we do not use ourselves with all the technology available to spread the word of God. Um, so when, when, I talk, when I brought that concept up, it's about you know, you have multi-level marketing or you have networking. What does the media enable us to do? It helps us with social networking and community building. So we have friends and friends of friends. So it gives us a completely different reach. And another thing, advantage is um, e-commerce. When we have our material available, it's now available to be read on books, on Kindle, on, uh, we have our media uh, we have our material available for sale on e-commerce sites. We, if you go to Amazon, you can find most of the Spirit of Prophecy books available there. So when people search, these are interesting topics that we have that people can just pick up very easily. So media is also helping us. Previously, uh, we used to have um, our evangelism done through selling of books. People used to go from door to door. Today, we are not able to reach people that easily. So this is one way that we can... Um, use e-commerce sites to sell our material. Now, one other important thing is about our youth. Most of our youth, so when we're talking about an average of two hours a day, it's not like every age group spends just two hours. The youth seem to spend more time on social media, on their phones, on different, I mean, it's not, they don't have to really be on Facebook or Instagram, but even YouTube channels. So here, what do we, how do we uh, address this? Give this as an opportunity. I'm going to read from messages to young people and life sketches and testimonies. Ellen White says, Grave responsibilities rest upon the youth. God expects much from the young men who live in this generation of increased light and knowledge. He expects them to impart this light and knowledge. He desires to use them in dispelling the error and superstition that clouds the minds of many. They are to discipline themselves by gathering up every jot and title of knowledge and experience. God holds them responsible for the opportunities and privileges given to them. The work before them is waiting for their earnest effort that it may be carried forward from point to point as the time demands. So this is a direct admonition to the youth that we need to use this opportunity which is in front of us today with increased knowledge and technology. We are the salt of the earth and light of the world, so we need to do this. Youth have to take up this opportunity. Okay, from Life Sketches, writing about commencement of the church, just pu publishing work, Ellen White wrote, from the small beginning, it was shown to me like streams of light that went clear around the world. I mean, why I thought about this is streams of light going all around the world. I think all the media that we see is full of light. Light in literal sense, light in terms of uh, dispelling the darkness within our lives, right? The spiritual light. So it can go to all ends of the world. The message of truth is to go to all nations, tongues and people. Its publications printed in many different languages are to be scattered abroad like leaves of autumn. That's what she says in 4 Testimonies, page 79. So it should be like leaves of autumn. That means our tracks, our glow tracks actually should be there everywhere. So if we can't do it in a physical manner, then we need to use technology, media to spread the good news about Jesus. So that's not just printed media, because Ellen and I talked about printed media those days. We just extend it to everything, radio, TV, uh, satellite, video, internet, podcasts, just about everything which is available today and may come up in the future, whatever is being developed today. 
But there are challenges in media ministry because we have our limitations. It's, let me talk about some of the misconceptions regarding media ministry. We need to understand that it's not an instant road to baptism. That's not what we expect from media ministry. Um, the, it's not a venue for a full 20-year doctrine evangelistic campaign. You can't do that. I mean, um, I should ask you, Twinkle, I think, the way you have reached our church is through media ministry, isn't it? So somebody reached out to your uh, Facebook, gave you studies, asked you to learn almost for a year before you could step into church. This, this is not a place to point out errors of everyone else's ways of demonstrating that what we have is the truth. So sometimes we misuse media to correct somebody else. We misuse media to correct our own church members. Right? So I, I see so many posts on Facebook where we're attacking our own church. And I feel so sad because um, many people, I mean, I, I have probably 2,000 people on my Facebook and they are, if they might have access to this. It's, if by chance I comment on any of these things and then somebody else starts commenting, so I'm very scared about it. So we need to really um, be careful about what, how we are um, presenting ourselves on social media. So one important thing, it's a province of, of qualified ministry or professional people it, while it is increasingly open to all and accessible to all, we need to have professional people from the church to be able to place the right messages. It is not a replacement for preaching or any other forms of Christian outreach and teaching today. It is not a stay-at-home armchair church. It is not that. Media ministry can be difficult as media, people who are usually with the media are not very inclined or pro-religion. It is possible. I'm not saying everybody, but you know, if you're, they're not as pro-religion, not very easy to reach. But if we have a good and interesting product, people who are with media, connected all the time, are hungry for news, hungry to know something. That's why they're there. So if we give them a good product, they can, they can start um, reading. The other thing, I mean, now we talked about what media is, what it is not. Now what is it? Making friends and breaking down barriers. You know, you can make a lot of friends through media. There can be a one-to-one -one relationship between the speaker and the writer in his or her audience, you know. So it, when we write something, it might touch somebody's heart because the Holy Spirit is touching hearts all the time. Creating a pool of goodwill in which our evangelistics, evangelists can fish. So we create the platform, we can bring our friends, we can invite them, and then you have the evangelists in church who can reach out to them. We can reach lonely and hurting people with the good news in the personal, non-threatening environment of their own home or their car. We can raise the profile of our church in the community, encourage people to think about choices and increase their knowledge of Christian things, and most important is leading them one step at a time in the Christian, um, towards the direction of Christian commitment. What's important is we cannot go overboard in media ministry. We need to take baby steps to reach. So how do we minister? Can somebody read 1 Corinthians 9, 19-23? 1 Corinthians 9, 19-23. Thank you. So also Acts 17, 16 to 34, you can go home and read. That's Acts 17, 16 to 34. I just brought these things two out because of what Paul has 
done. So in Acts 17, Paul talks about, I came and I saw you, I was in your marketplace. So he actually worked on knowing his audience in advance, understanding what their trade is, what do they do every day. And he said, you're looking for God, you're very religious people, with a, but not with the right God. So he figured that out. You know, we have a lot of religious people, but they are just not um, introduced to the truth. So he understood that and he made use of that opportunity. And what Noah just read, he talked about how he um, got himself familiar with them and became them without compromising on the principles of the church, without compromising on the principles of the Bible. He has reached out to them. So these are two important things, understanding who are whom we are reaching out and we do this. We cannot um, not read and expect somebody else to read. We cannot not listen and expect somebody else to listen. So we need to do those things first to know how they can use, how can uh, we spread. Now the last couple of things which I want to talk about is while media is very effective, it has to be, the product should be good. We have to be a resource generating church. The size of a church doesn't matter. The quality of the message which is going out is what really matters. And while we're going through media, we can be easily distracted to do whatever comes our way. So let's always remember, this is from the Media Critic Award of Builder Club, that whenever they're in front of the TV or any media, they should Keep this in their mind. We made the children memorize Philippians 4, 8. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. So when we go and sit in front of the media, very easily we can be distracted. Wherever we go, let's remember this. And when we put this effort, God is going to bless our work. Acts 1.8 says, But ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost is come upon you, and ye shall witness unto me both in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. Let's all rise to the closing song and sing uh, song number 202. Zero two, so hell, hell in the king of glory. Again in strife and commotion, warnings by the day. Signs in the heavens, unerring omens, herald the glorious day. Hail him, the King of glory, once the Lamb of sin has slain. 
story, Jesus comes to reign. Children of God, look up with rejoicing, shout and sing His praise. Blessed are they who, waiting and watching, look for the dawning rays. Hail Him, the King of glory, once the lamp of sin has slain. Tell, tell the wondrous story, Jesus comes to reign. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for this wonderful Sabbath day and Lord for specifically teaching us many things to spread your word. We especially, Lord, thank you for the technology that you have impressed many minds to prepare in multiple different ways and giving us so many platforms. Father, you said that if you do not speak, you will even pick up the stones to spread your message. Lord, we are still there as a church, and we still have the opportunity. Father, please give us um, the empowerment and the nurturing that is needed to be instruments for your cause. Lord, we ask you to be with all the members of the media ministries and the communication department across the globe as they focus on this theme, as we all focus on this theme, the Sabbath. Father, every member, Every believer is a minister, Father. So teach us in our own ways to use every mode of media that you're giving us that we have access to only for your glory. Father, we ask you to be with the Sabbath school teachers and everyone in the classes today as we study your word. Please give your wisdom from above so that whatever message you have is completely understood in the right light. We also ask you to be with the mission projects across the world while we are collecting offerings. We ask you to bless each family which is extending the support to the projects of this quarter. Father, we also ask you to be with the rest of the program and the divine service today. All this I ask in Jesus' precious name. Amen. I thank every participant uh, who has taken a wonderful part in this Sabbath school service. And as we are moving to our lesson study, the Sabbath school classes are held as usual in different places and I request you all to continue <coughs> prayers for the Sabbath school, um, the mission that we have here. Let's disperse from our classes. The collegiate class will be taken right there um, in the, near the children's Sabbath school. Kindergarten class is already um, on. The primary class is online, but we also have the class in the vestry here. The adult Sab the cornerstone class will be taken by Pastor Darrell and the PowerPoint class by Noah. The adult Sabbath school class will be live streamed and available here, led by Elder Bob and Workers. We can now disperse to our classes.
happy Sabbath to all of you. It's, today we have a larger class, but spread all over. So I don't know how we can come together. Yeah, the other solution is the ones in the back can come front. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> well, welcome to our uh, uh, Sabbath school lesson study that we will take part. I think we've 10, 20 now, so maybe about half an hour we'll spend in our lesson study. Before we begin, let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Merciful and loving Father which art in heaven, we thank you God for this morning. Thank you for blessing us with this lesson of God. And as we study more and more about thee, O Lord, we pray that you will draw us close to thee. Our faith in thee might be get stronger, O Lord. That we might be the people who will be able to sing the song of Moses and of the Lamb. And give you all the glory and the praises that are due to you, O Lord. Bless us in all our discussions. Give us the discernment and the understanding of your word. For we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so we are in the crucible with Christ. And today the lesson is entitled The Bird Cage. Okay, and um, our memory text says, In this you greatly rejoice. Though now for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials. So, again, talking about this crucible, and uh, I, I hope that by the end of this quarter, we will have a clear understanding of this crucible and what the crucible is and all that. Uh, as we go and studying, we will get a better understanding of that. And so, you know, it gives us an interesting illustration, I mean, a, uh, a paragraph taken from the Ministry of Healing. And uh, I think most of you have gone through it, of the, the master who wants to uh, train the caged bird, okay, and, uh, you know, to sing. Now, what, what is interesting is that the bird needs to you know, be put in a in a dark cage for it to sing, and that's the the thing. And so, the question, I mean, the author is trying to bring out a concept here of uh, you know, and sometimes God brings us into dark places, okay, and. Uh, if God brings us into dark places, what should be its purpose? What do you think God lets us go through dark places or dark circumstances? What is the purpose? Is it to punish us? Is it for our wrong doing? What do you think? What, what, why did the master put the, the bird? In dark places, how would you learn? Huh? Even the bird, when it was isolated and covered and kept, when the master spoke to it daily the same words, it was able to understand and speak. When it is kept in the crowd, so many different voices are coming, it was not able to understand and speak anything. So, so which means it was basically to avoid the distractions. Okay, it was put in the dark place to avoid distractions that could take his mind away. You know, so sometimes God leads us into dark places to get our minds focused, to get ourselves focused. But, uh, you know, every dark situation, sometimes we bring ourselves into dark situations, right? Uh, we have in instances of when the prodigal son goes into a dark situation or uh, Jonah, okay? Must have been very dark to be in the in the belly of the 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 fish, 
Okay, but those are things that you bring upon yourself. But God, you know, brings us into circumstances and those things where we can take away distractions. And so one of the things that we can learn from this is that, uh, you know, there are times when we need to stay away. We need to move away from the busyness of life and spend more time with God to listen to his voice. And that's another thing that we can learn is when we can spend more time. And so maybe the people who live in, in on the countryside or the country living people who want to go out should be have probably open spaces for some of us to go and spend time there and listen to the voice of God. But it's also interesting is that the song that the the master sings, it says is that in uh, in Revelation 14, 1, I mean, uh, uh, 14, 3, it says of the, the saints, and it's basically talking about the 144,000, and they sang a new song before the throne and before the four living creatures, the elders, and no one could learn the song except the 144,000 who had been redeemed from the earth. And so what is that song that they are singing? What do you think is that singing that they are singing? The song. The song of their love, their experience, their experience with God. Okay? And that is why each has an experience with God. You cannot teach others this song because it says nobody else could sing. You cannot give this because it is your own experience that you come across with God. And that's why each of us needs to go through that experience with God. It is very personal. So this song can come to us only by a relationship. And so this whole lesson is taking us into different circumstances. One is how God leads the children of Israel. And then we have the second part when God leads Jesus Christ. And the third part is when? This people on earth. Okay. His faithful people. And so different, uh, you know, circumstances, periods, but all very similar. Okay. And the first is when the children of Israel Okay, and comes to, I mean, rescued from uh, Egypt. Why do you think, okay, God, I mean, God is the one who's leading them, right? You have the pillar of cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night. And what do they come? Where do they come to? They come to the Dead Sea. I mean the Red Sea, not the Dead Sea, the Red Sea. Okay. Why, why, I mean, they were so trapped on both sides of mountains and then you have the sea in front and then you have what? The Egyptian at the back. Why were they trapped? What was God's intention here? To make them understand in any circumstances God is there to help them. To make them understand in all circumstances God was there? I mean, he could have done many things, right? I mean, he could have stopped the Egyptians from coming. He could have built a wall. I mean, uh, he could just brought stones up and said, don't go further. Okay, or, uh, you know, caused an earthquake for the Egyptians that they won't come this side. Many things. But why, why do you think he allowed the Egyptians to come? And then, you, as Mr. Victor says, to make them rely on God. Almighty God. He is the God Almighty. He can protect them and He can guide them to the promised land. So He was leading them from Egypt. Okay, He was leading them from Egypt. Egypt. And, uh, that I mean, is where He used both a pillar of uh, clouds and pillar of uh, fire also. And He used in the midst of this uh, Red Sea. He divided the Red Sea while they were going. And the Bible says that he used that uh, pillar of clouds for Egyptians. 
yeah, to be yeah, adored. I mean, uh, he protected. He he gave them a, uh, yeah. some distance for those things for their to to basically to you protect know, them. Burn up some more. more. Yeah. I don't know what it is. Yes, uh, Colonel. God could have led them straight to the promised land, the shortest way, but he didn't do it because in their sojourn of 450 years of captivity, they had forgotten even the name of God. So these are the obstacles or chances for God to bring them to almost dead end so that they cry out unto the Lord and remember his goodness. And secondly, he wants to make a difference between the true worshippers and the pagans who followed in the Egyptians to show how God can be uh, so ruthless with those who disobey him. Okay, so one is unlearning their 50 year, I mean their 400 years of bondage or their life. I'll yeah, come back to Dr. Borghe. Okay, and then to also show the difference. Okay, point taken. Yes, Dr. Borghe. Come to a dead end in our spiritual experience. We, are sh <coughs> we don't know where to go, what to do, and that's where God was trying to do. What did he say to his children? He says, you have come to a dead end. People were trying to find some way to escape. Men were trying to do things to earn salvation, to make them escape. But when you know that you are in a dead end, you can't do anything, God steps in. And when God steps in, what did he tell them? He told Moses, what? Go forward. These people were wondering, he, he says, go forward. So if you are really interested in God, if you have devoted your life to God, he says, go forward. And you don't have to question God. God will make a way. Even in your spiritual life, when you come to a dead end, God will step you and make a way. And this is why God says, go forward with me. Okay, so so it is when when we come through circumstances or when we come to a dead end or when we feel trapped, okay, that it, it is a lesson for us that you know these are circumstances. What what does it do? It enables us to to strengthen our faith in God, to depend upon Him when we are helpless. And so in the first lesson, the children of Israel, after all those ten plagues and all those miracles, God's protection, then you have this cloud of fire and everything that was there. They still needed to learn to what? Rely upon God. To depend upon Him. That was the first lesson they had to learn. Was in this, is, as uh, Colonel Dev has pointed out, he could have just taken them the short path. Okay. Many people have done this journey after that. It was not a very long journey. But a, a, a three month journey was supposed to be a, a learning experience for these children of Israel. And so the first is, first lesson was what? Dependence. Learning dependence. And dependence, what does it do? Hmm? It learns to put your trust in God. Okay, because you are helpless, you have to put your trust in something, in someone, for you to overcome. Okay, and so, for faith to get stronger, what does it need? Hmm? Faith to get stronger, what does it need? It needs the exercising of faith. Just like any of us need to, to, for us to get stronger, you need exercise. If you want to strengthen your muscle, you need an exercising of it. And so that was the first thing that they had to do was to learn to trust God and exhibit their faith, which would basically strengthen their faith. And so that, that's something that we see here. And then the, this is where the lesson very nicely tells us. Following the pillar doesn't assure us of constant happiness. It also can be a hard experience because training in righteousness takes us to places that test our hearts which are so naturally deceitful. During these difficulties, the key to knowing when we are truly following God is not necessarily the absence of trials or pain, but rather an, an openness 
to God's instruction, a continual submission of our minds and hearts to his leading. And that's, that's where it is. It was just because the pillar of fire and the pillar of cloud was there, it doesn't mean it was constant or, or we are going to the promised land. Let's go. God can put us, okay, I have enough faith and let God carry me in a wheelbarrow and take me straight into the promised land. That was not God's intention at all. Okay? Sorry? With you, who should be going? With you, he would be, he would travel with you. Yes. He would teach you lessons. And uh, the same thing is, you know, as in our journey also, we go through circumstances where we will learn. Yes, Dr. Borge. When he led the children of Israel, where was the cloud of fire? Sorry? Cloud of fire was. In the night. Where? where? It was leading them. It was in the night. In, in the night. And the daytime? The cloud. The pillar of cloud was there, okay. protecting them from the sun. But when Jesus said to go forward, where did the cloud come? Universes. Yes. So it is said, God said, go. Now I'm protecting you. You don't believe in me? You go forward now. I'll protect you from the back. The cloud of darkness was there, blocking the enemy from not troubling you. So the God says, look, you go forward. Now I was leading you. Now I'll bring this darkness and cover the enemy. Push him back. He will not see you. Just have faith in me. Trust in me. And I will lead you in the right path. He said, just have that faith, that trust in me, and I will lead you to the promised land. Yeah. So, so God, even in, in trying circumstances, we find it interesting is that God's intervention is there. Okay. It is not that all is lost. At times, you feel trapped. You may feel these things. But even in those difficult times, God's protection was there for the children of Israel. And so, you know, many times in our journey is when we have this faith in God, we want everything to be nice. We want everything to be good. Okay. But when we live in a world of sin, okay, the natural decay, the natural disasters, the natural trials are there for us. And God leads us through that. For what? For our learning experience, for our growth, for our faith to grow stronger, that we will learn to trust Him, to depend upon Him. And they were, and the Egyptians were fast approaching. And that is the time they felt that they would lose their lives. They were afraid of them and they started to cry to God directly. When they saw them coming far away, they went to Moses and asked, See, our enemies are coming there and you want us to kill here. We, you think we had no graves there in Egypt? See, all these things they were making. Then later on what happened? When they started to approach a little closer, that is where they were very confident that they would be captured by the enemies. But uh, that is where God said, send that pillar of clouds to block them and protect them to, and uh, gave them instruction to march forward. He divided the sea and they, was, they were going yeah. forward. So, so God, God's and it is not they who should be fighting because God assured them that I will fight for you. You go ahead. See? It is God who brought them victory. It is God who fought that day. Yeah, I mean, th those were in the later parts of yeah. it that they learned that they were, but in the initial, when they come out of Egypt, they were thought that this was a quick way to go to the things, but God had yeah. to He assured them. He's, he told them, the Egyptians whom you will see today, you will never see them again. Right. Your see? enemies, you will never see them again is what he, he had given them also. The assurance in that. And so it took faith. You know, the first lesson was for them was when you are trapped is that you would need faith. And many times when we need faith, when we face dark circumstances or we need to overcome this. And sometimes which is more difficult? Where do you need more faith? When you, your prayer is answered, when you ask for something or when your prayer is answered not the way you wanted it to be. 
Sometimes. Which needs more faith? Sometimes we depend on our own selves. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we depend Sometimes we, on we have only our plans. We want yes. our ways. Yes. We want this to be. God, I, I have this problem. You know, let me be made all right. Or this disease. But then God has answers in a very different way. It needs more faith. Yes. When, when God takes us through another way and then it is only when we can ask God for the lessons or what is he trying to teach us through those trying circumstances. God okay, wanted. just like what Paul, what does he say? Let, you know, this thorn be removed. Yeah. And what does God say to him? My grace is sufficient for I you. I have given you my grace and that's sufficient for you. Okay, he desired to, you know, to, uh, you know, his arrest and his execution and all that. You see, the very interesting part of it is that there are times when he would desire to go and share, but God has a different plan, a different purpose for See, him. God wanted them to only trust in him yes. and go forward. Yep. And so, this is what we find is that when you trust God, God can lead us and guide us. And so, we come to the next part is that this lesson points us to brings us where? To, the, to not only this deliverance of the Red Sea, but then he brings us where? from the desert okay to get Refidim, thirsty Refidim. Yeah. they come thirsty and they first come to where not to Refidim they come to Mara Mara, Mara or bitter waters okay? and they come to Mara and what does it again show there hmm? they get water they're thirsty you know this journey brings them to trials and difficulties and then they come to this place where they're bitter Okay, and what is again the children of Israel's they response started, there? They'll start uh, murmuring. Murmuring and say, this water is bitter and we are thirsty. Yeah. But again, God tells Moses, okay, that, that what? You... The branch. Hmm? He will ask him to cut the Go branch. Go put the bark there and the water is sweet. And so, what's the lesson we can learn from that? God can turn our bitterness into sweetness. From our painful experience to a sweet experience. What's the lesson we are learning from it? Then? What does God want us to learn from that? To the children of Israel, what is the lesson that they were... You know, when, when things... You know, even if things... You see water is there. God, there is a reliance on God. There is a dependence upon God. Yeah, God meets when our you requirements. Are, when, when you are helpless... God can then give you a Me. deliverance. Okay? And that's where the first promise, I think, is given to the children of Israel. Is that it says, what does it say? That, you know, after this, okay? When you... Yeah, in the uh, 15, it says here, and... On the 26th verse, and said, If thou wilt diligently hearken to the voice of the Lord, thy God, and wilt do that which is right in his sight, and wilt give ear to his commandments, and keep all his statutes, I will put none of these diseases upon thee, which I have brought upon the Egyptians, for I am the Lord that healeth thee. Okay? The first thing is what? If you follow me, diligently if you keep my commandments so which means commandments did not come on mount sinai before that is a, this is at just at the at the the start of their journey which means the commandments was there with the children of israel and that's the interesting part here is that if you follow me okay none of these diseases that fell upon the egyptians would be upon you which means is that if you follow God diligently, those lifestyle diseases that come upon you, natural aging and those, the things would still be there because we live in a world of sin. But those other things that fell upon the Egyptians would not be there if you followed God diligently. And we can see here is that God was not trying to, you know, to upset them or anything. But each of those were a learning point for the children of Israel and then after this drinking of the sweet water they come to a point where they, they what, where is it? they come to 
in the journey they come to Elim. And what is Elim for? There is so much of abundance of water, there is well, there is uh, the date trees and all that. But did God want them to settle there? In this journey of life, there are times when, you know, it suddenly becomes nice and green and prosperous. But where was their focus to be on? Hmm? To the promise that God had made. To the promised land that I'm going to take you. Not at Elim. Not to stay there. Not to get used to that Elim. And that's a lesson that we can learn is that, you know, in our journey of this life, there are times that are good, there are times that are hard. Okay? But not be, where is our focus upon? To the promise that God has made to take us to that promised land. And then it's that next journey that comes well. It's completely dry. There's no bit of water, there's nothing else. They come, why, why do you think, what was God trying again to teach them there? For three days in the desert. Hmm? They have walked in the desert for three days. Right. They needed the water. With those things, though it is not the typical hot desert because if you have the pillar of cloud there covering you. But three days is a quite long time and everything probably would have dried up. Yeah. Right? From Elim they would have filled up their bottles their whatever that they were carrying. The three days was enough to dry up. They come to a desert where there is no water, water. refed in. Yes, Dr. Borge. The children of Israel had nothing to complain about. They had seen the evidences of God leading him right from the deliverance from the Egyptian, the ten plagues, then parting of the Red Sea, turning the, the bitter water into sweet and giving him. They had no thing. Everything was given to us, given to them. They should have been grateful. It happens to in our life. Everything God gives us, suddenly something small thing happens to us. You, then you will start saying like children, is God with us or not with us? Is God troubling, you know? So this is what exactly happens to us in our spiritual, uh, spiritual life. God supplies all your needs. And when there is a small little thing that sort of pricks us, a sort of how many of you question, is God with us or God not with us? You know, just like the children of Israel. But I think once a person has submitted his life to God completely, he will walk and go forward in faith accepting whatever God gives him. Whether it is trials, whether it is persecution or anything, he will take it for granted that God is making him better for a better purpose. Yeah, so, so what happens to us when you face trial? God has led you, God has done this, everything is for you, but when you come to probably, you know, a dead end, maybe it's terminal, Maybe the doctor has told you, you have only, you know, a few weeks to live. What happens to you? When you come to that second, when you have no more risk, when you have no more, uh, you know, hope. Israelites say more grumbling. Huh? Israelites say more grumbling after all Israelites their experiences. Israelites grumbled. Okay. Is God here with us? Is God with us? Is there? Yes, Mala. If your faith is strong, I don't think you will grumble. Okay. If your faith is strong, and how does your faith grow strong? This one, yeah. Faith, See the. Okay. So then we are depending upon God's will, and at that. So this is what I'm saying is, you f you come across. In the in the. In Egypt, you had those ten plagues. God's protection was there. It was very clear as when the rain destroyed or the hail destroyed their crops, the Egyptian in Goshen were safe. They didn't have, I mean, the Israelite in, in Goshen were safe. All those things, and but yet when you come to a dry land, when you don't have water, when you are a dead end, again you are murmuring and complaining. Yes, Mr. Victor, you are... Yeah, that's all. See, we from sitting here, we, we discuss so many things. But the people literally who saw everything, all the benefits and all the difficulties were there and even God took care of them so wonderfully, but still their hearts were so hard and they were not able to understand Him. That's the reason every small problem is there, they start grumbling and ready to fight. Yeah, yeah, but uh, these lessons are there to realize yes, that they should have we realized, are no different from Israel. Yes, that's also. correct. 
yeah Okay, when your need is strong, you forget God. But yeah. that is where I think Mrs. Yeah. White says is that, what does it say? Yes, for three we days they never had water. We have nothing to fear for the future, except we forget how God has led us. If we forget how God has led us, otherwise we have nothing to fear for the future. Yes, Colonel. Uh, Refidim means a place of rest. It was a very, it was an oasis in the desert. As you said, there are plenty of greenery, water, everything was available. But the heathens who lived there didn't want these strangers, the, the Israelites, to settle down there. And even God didn't want. So the Amalekites attacked them at that place. And God saved them even there. Time and again, God leads them into uh, bottlenecks. That's, it's uh, leading into temptation is not, temptation is not sin, but falling to temptation is sin. Even Christ was led to the wilderness after his fasting by the spirit, and it says to be tempted by Satan. So this is a parallel journey the Israelites are making to the promised land. They have to face difficulties like we face in our lives, but we should not leave lose our faith and trust in the Almighty. Yep. So, the interesting thing about Rephidim is that, you know, what is it? Look at Moses now. God gives an order. How does Moses show a different sort of faith? Did Moses have faith there? Did Moses exhibit faith there? Certainly, right? Yes. Just imagine God tells you, go do this, you know, uh, strike a rock. Okay, it's, I mean, You've never seen, you know, something that it's all dry, everything is gone. And then God says, you strike this rock and you will get the water. It's okay. quite natural that, it's, uh, Sorry? it's quite, as human, it is quite natural that you don't find your need for three days, you will cry. True, Isn't you will it? cry, you will turn to God, no doubt about it, you will so cry. That's what they have but done, they cried and Moses asked, and God asked him to smite the rock. Yes, yes. but the, the thing about what was the danger was, is God still among us? Yeah, Many times we ask the same questions. Is God dead? Is God not there? Is God watching me? Is God seeing this? And this is where the faith of Moses is exhibited. And why did you think Moses had this faith? What made Moses different? Yes, Dr. Borghe. What's, what's the difference between... Just of our opposite of faith is what? Sorry? What is the opposite of faith? Or just something opposite of faith? What do we call it? What is the opposite of faith? Fear? Pre presumption. Is that correct? What's that? Yeah. It is presumption. presumption. Yeah. Okay. Presumption yeah. is opposite of faith. Or, you know, people, if you don't have presumption. What people think is God is a God of love, mercy, long-suffering. He won't do this. If I do it, again, what happened? He's ready to forgive me, you know? Like that, you, that is called what? Cheap grace. He's saying, okay, you do whatever you want. God is a God of love. He will do everything. But God wants us to test us so that we will go through this fiery furnace, purify us, and help us to be, make better, fitter vessels for his kingdom. True, yeah. No, I mean, as, as David prays, keep me away from presumptuous sins is when you when you are presumptuous that you will you go that's that's another danger or as dr borge pointed was the opposite of that is to fully depend upon god or to be presumptuous and do what you want to okay as we see that later the children of israel does that but we find is that moses faith is exhibited because moses does not forget how god had led in the past okay that this god could lead because God could ask him to strike the sea and the sea would part. The same God who could bring water from a rock. And so that is where it is that how God has led us is so important for each of us to learn. In, in our daily walk with God, God has, to each of us, God has led us in many, many ways. But when you come to a, 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 a junction where you are helpless, again remember how God could lead you in the past. And so this is the first part of it. The second part we've already running quickly into uh, time, but is when the life of Jesus, 
very very similar parallels are there what are the parallels between the calling of israel and uh, the calling of jesus there are parallels in it right both come out of egypt hmm they are called out of egypt into the other things both are given a task there is something that is looked forward to okay and what is it that jesus now comes into the scene but he is again the son of god okay or god himself who comes to the earth takes upon him the the human the humanity and then what is it the spirit says is after his baptism luke says is that what is it that he was taken to the wilderness the spirit led him into the wilderness just like israel they lead from egypt into the wilderness okay and for what purpose was it it was to again learn to trust god to depend upon him to learn from him 40 days was where jesus spent time in prayer in the things in preparing for his ministry and you know that was to come for him and so we find jesus spending his time there and so the temptation of jesus okay was jesus tempted or was hmm bible says that he was tempted yeah the lord's the lord's prayer also says in matthew 6 right lead us not in to temptation so what is it that we are actually talking about the leading of god okay the trials that come by it to tempt is sometimes it can be debatable tempt is only when you desire to move away from god okay but in this case it is not it is only the leading that you see here that's where i think the lesson is trying to say is that god doesn't tempt uh, the thing as uh, the lesson points out that we are not really tempted by god okay and where does it take from from james so when not god doesn't tempt us god only leads us okay through circumstances through trials through difficulties for what for the strengthening of your faith so that you will learn to trust god and so pure but in the case of jesus that we see is that probably jesus is not no if you really look at the meaning of temptation is that when you if you're tempted to curse god as as job's wife would say curse god and die there's a temptation there but she says what is it you speak as a a foolish woman there okay so that's that's the thing but when jesus responds to the devil was what okay to depend upon god it is written the word of god i have studied this word of god i know what the word of god says and he is there that faithful you do not live, need to live by bread alone you know 40 days of hunger leads to to you know desperate hunger okay that it would be very attractive for the stones to be made bread yes dr borge it is i think if you read the great controversy it will carefully says when jesus was baptized Satan knew God had pronounced that this is my beloved son in whom I well please. Satan knew about it. Satan also knew he was in heaven. He was cast down. He knew that it was Jesus. He was the monarch. He is the real person who gave his going to sort of nullify his works that he has done. He knew about it. He says when Jesus came out of the water, he was glow you know clothed with the glory of god and he was raised to a little bit higher level than human beings but when satan tempted jesus didn't know that this was satan he didn't come in a black suit or a big ears and claws and everything he came like a bright angel so it came his temptation was almost at the end of his fast as if it were because at that time he was very feeling very hungry and satan said this is the best time <coughs> Adam and Eve was treated what 
tempted because of appetite. And he said, this is the first time I'm going to, I know he's very venerable, I will tempt him because of his appetite. And he said, if you are the son of God, make this, you know, <coughs> stones into bread. bread. And, but then when Satan was tempted him, that glory that was surrounding him and the status of the little lifted to the human being was taken off. He faced Satan just like as we are, as human beings, and he overcame the temptation. And I think this is what we can, if we completely rely, what did God did? Jesus didn't find a way how to escape. He didn't know what to do. He was hungry. He said, let me eat. The angel has come from what? Heaven. He thought it was an angel from heaven that came to sustain him. But then when he asked this question, he realized who it is. And as a result, he didn't succumb to this temptation. But what did he do? He bent on his knees. He went on his knees and prayed to God to ask help and strength. And that's why how you overcame temptations. Yeah, so, so you overcome temptation by what? To rely upon God's word, to depend upon him, to learn of him. And so this, that's the important part of our of this journey is that always be connected with God. And uh, that's, I mean, the question that comes is, why did Jesus have to go through all this temptation? He was coming, he had to just die and then uh, get away, right? Why did he have to go through temptation? Why did he have to go through trials? Yes, Colonel Dennis. One reason I feel is, that he wanted to identify himself in his human form with our lives. We have to go through temptation. So he just cannot say that, no, I won't go through it. I'll go straight away and die. Secondly, temptation come to, came to him and to us in three forms. First is the worldly pleasures. The Satan showed in the entire world. He was very attractive, but he did not fall in. Secondly, Satan catches us in, when our flesh is weak, he was very weak after 40 days of fasting. That's where he played on his hunger and said, convert this into stone. And thirdly, Satan says, I am the prince of the world. I will come directly, bow down and worship me, which even Christ denied. So we have to guard against this in case we have to be successful in temptation. So Christ straight away did not go to the cross. He went through the temptation to teach us that we are more susceptible to teach us. Okay, yeah. So that's why in Hebrews 5, 7 to 10, it says, During the days of Jesus' life on earth, he offered up prayers and petitions with loud cries and tears to the one who could save him from death. He was heard because of his reverent submission. And although he was a son, he learned obedience from what he suffered. And once made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him and was designated by God to be the high priest in the order of Melchizedek. So what did he have to do? He had to, through obedience, it was not something that came from heaven to him. In his humanity, through, through obedience, he had to develop a character. And that's where Hebrews again says is that we have a high priest who was what? Tempted in all points, just like as what we are. Okay. Do you think Jesus went through all uh, temptations? All of these things? Hmm? The scripture says is he went through everything. Okay. The desire, the weakness of humanity, even at, at Gethsemane. Father, if it were possible, take this cup, that fear of, of the, the things of going through the separation of the father was the thing in that, you know, in his the thing. But then, what is it? He knew his purpose. He knew his, his goal for what, it, what he had come here to earth for. Okay? And that's where it was, was what, what is it? The scripture says is what, what? Is that, you know, Jesus looking at what? The, the joy that was set before him. By what? After he overcame the cross, the joy of what? What was his joy? To see his children to be saved. That was what his goal was. 
The same thing was, you know, it says of Abraham. What does it say? He looked forward to what? To the city that what God has built. And so there is a focal point there. Okay? To Jesus was the joy that was set him. To Abraham was the joy. To the children of Israel, it should have been the joy of getting into the promised land. But when you lose your focus on that, then yes, but Jesus never lost his focus. And he overcame every temptation that Satan could to throw at him. Okay. And yet he was the overcomer. And so it comes to the third point of ours is in our life on earth. Okay, on this life on earth, what is our focus? What do you think should be our focus? To live a pleasurable life on this earth? Hmm? To the city that God has prepared. I go to prepare a mansion for you. I go to prepare a place for you. I go that where you, where, what is it? That you will be with me where I am. Okay, and that's, that's what we should be looking forward to. And if we keep our focus on that, then the trials and tribulations, as Peter says, that we will have trials. Each of these trials, as this lesson points out, is like the crucible that we have put in the crucible. Okay, where we go through the trials, but as overcomers, we will be victorious. We will be able to then see, because this life is what? A process of what? Hmm? This, each of these trials is a process of our sanctification. Okay? As, a, as, as Paul says, what is it? Sanctification is what? A lifelong process. We are sanctified. So, yes, yes, come. But the saving grace is, he will not allow us to be tempted for more than what we can bear. Yes. So we must take that. Right? That's, that's the assurance given to us that even, even to the children of Israel, you come to a, to a point or uh, to, uh, uh, where you think that everything is lost. But in the sight of God, God has a plan. God has an escape. God has a road. But just like the faith of Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego was, what is it? Their response was, even if we have to die, okay, we will not bow down. And that's the faith that each of us must have, is that even if we have to, because where is our focus? On the resurrected Christ. And that's why Paul says that if Christ was not resurrected, all my preaching was what? Would have been in vain. And that's where our focus is, is that on this city, on this resurrected Christ, on this living God. So even if we face death, even if we will not get across this, this barrier that I'm going through, keep your eyes focused upon Jesus. And each of those will give us the victory that God has promised us to be. Yes, there is, is your final comment. There is hope for everyone. There is hope for everyone, but you know, not the hope that sometimes what we desire. Okay? But a desire, the ultimate desire is to be with our Lord. And if that is our desire, we will not fear for what we face on this earth. Yes, Dr. Borge. Yes, like to say. In conclusion, our journey yeah, to the with your last comment. <laughs> yeah. Our journey to the heavenly kingdom is not all sunshine. We have to meet the storms in order to go into that eternal home God has prepared for us. Not sunshine all the way. We have to face the storms. Yeah. It's not a journey on a wheelbarrow straight up to heaven. But Jesus said was it? Okay? Narrow is the way. The wide way is for what? will go to destruction. But the narrow way where we will go through the trial as the pilgrim makes his journey. The journey has these things, but each of those will strengthen our faith that when you see the Lord coming in the clouds, you will be able to say, this is my Lord for whom I have waited so long. Let's close with a word of prayer. Mr. Devdas. Yeah, he will not forsake us. He will lead us in an innocent prayer place. Devdas. Sorry, yeah, okay. Let's pray. Our holy and kind Father which art in heaven, thank you Lord for helping us to learn the lesson at the feet of Christ. We thank you Lord for the teacher who guided us. Thank you Lord for helping us to understand that you will not 
forsake us, you will not cast us off. You have given us the hope of resurrection and hope of eternal life. Help us, Lord, to overcome all the tests in our lives and thou we have a Saviour who will purify us, perfect us and prepare us for a glorious home. As Israel's experience the mighty power, the mighty hand, the mighty guidance in their lives, we have the glorious hope, we have glorious resurrection and we have glorious eternal life ahead of us. Help us to overcome all the difficulties and trials in our lives. For your sake, help us to overcome. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you for your participation and please go through your lesson. Don't get tired of the word crucible. Yeah. Okay, there are many things that we can learn from this quarter.